Hello. I just wanted to check that out. Oh. Oh, nice. Nope. Nope. We are live, clearly. Uh, welcome. This is the fifth and final episode of the Meta's Conversation Series. This has been an initiative that's been brought to you by a partnership between the Meta's, the Montreal English Theatre Awards, and the Siegel Centre for the Performing Arts. My name is Caitlin Murphy. I've been hosting conversations over the last couple of weeks as we build up to the awards, which are on Sunday, people. Sunday, November 29th at 7 p.m. Happening where? Where everything happens, inside your computer. Uh, but I happen to know for a fact that there are tons of people working really hard, running around like crazy right now, trying to bring us a very exceptional ceremony. And we are all very lucky to have such a wonderful community of people working to make something special happen and giving the big mm to COVID. So uh, thank you to the Metas for making something happen in this really difficult time. So we've been talking to uh, designers, to directors, to writers, to emerging artists. And uh, tonight, of course, last, uh, the final curtain call, we are talking to performers tonight. Uh, so without further ado, I want to bring on the um, bring on the performers. So first to welcome Julie Tomiko Manning, who's nominated for supporting performance in Paradise Lost produced by the Centaur. Hi, Julie. Welcome. Hi, Caitlin. <laughs> <laughs> Next, Amir Sam Nakjavani, who's nominated for supporting award for his performance in Winter's Daughter brought to you by Tabla Dote. Hi, good to see you. Uh, next, Matt Cobway, who's nominated for lead performance in Mob, which was produced by the Centaur Theater. Yeah. Hi, Matt. Good to see you. Next, Alex Petrachuk, who's nominated for her performance in lead in Chattermarks, produced by Cabal Theater. Hi, Alex. Hi, Caitlin. And finally, Patrick Park, who's nominated for his performance in the Ensemble of Mythic, produced by the Siegel Center. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Hey. It's so good to see you. Thank you so much for joining on this last evening of the conversation series. Really looking forward to talking to you guys. And congratulations on your nominations as well. Uh, so let's jump right into the productions that you're nominated for. And I want you to just give us a sense of the role or the character that you portrayed and also what you would say was the greatest challenge or biggest joy, I'll let you pick, of uh, playing that character. So why don't we start with you, Alex? Uh, yeah, so um, I played the character of Hilda in uh, Chattermarks, written by, oh, that's a good photo, written <laughs> by uh, Kyle Crouch, uh, Anthony Kennedy, and um, Joseph Schrag. Um, and uh, I would say that there were uh, plenty of challenges that presented themselves in that work, um, because acting is really hard. <laughs> but um, I would say that one of the greatest challenges was maintaining Hilda's sort of physicality. Um, mm -hmm. I had to embody this character who was quite literally like frozen in time and space and she was unable to sort of rip herself from from the past. So she suffered like pretty extreme like PTSD and was pretty much like um, frozen alive, I would say. So mm -hmm. she constantly tremored and had quite an internal heaviness about her, which is very different from how I carry myself through the world, I would say. Um, so that was really difficult and exhausting to sustain, but overall a really rewarding and remarkable challenge. Mm. What about you, Julie? Who did you portray in Paradise Lost? What was the challenge or joy of that? Um, first of all, I just want you to know that when you asked Alex that, I was like, oh my God, now I'm going to have to like name the title of the play so I had to write it down because I was like what if I forget like anyway um <laughs> it, it's a show called Paradise Lost it was at the Centaur <laughs> written by Aaron Shields and uh ja directed by Jackie Maxwell and I played um Sin <laughs> I played the character Sin and uh the angel Zephon right there you can see that's Sin uh and that's Jake Wilkinson my my son, uh, and uh, that was actually probably the biggest joy about this play 
was getting mm. to to uh, play opposite Jake um, because we also played our angels uh, played opposite each other. Um, my biggest uh, uh, challenge was playing opposite Jake. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> because. He's because he's my son. He's taller than me. I can't have a son that that is that old and that tall. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> the the biggest challenge? No, okay. Seriously, I think the biggest challenge for me and and this is <laughs> Caitlin. <laughs> and this is I think in general is I have um I have a, a trouble taking my space on stage. Um, like, believe it or not, it's been, you know, 20, over 25 years of, of working in this, uh, in this universe. And I still have trouble taking my space up on stage. Mm. Um, so I'd like to sort of give a little shout out to, um, amazing actor and friend, uh, Lenny Parker. And when I was doing role a couple of years ago, I was like, oh my God, I'm so stuck. I don't know what to do. And she's just like, just take your space on stage. Just take the space. Um, and I think that was probably the biggest thing. Because Sin is a, you know, she was a big character. She was very um, uh, bi bordering on dramatic. Oh my God, my phone is like low battery. I knew something was going to happen. <laughs> Ask somebody else now. I'm going to go plug it in. <laughs> okay. So Patrick, over to you. Uh, who did you portray? And what was one of the biggest challenges or joys? Uh, yeah, sure. So I, I was in the ensemble of Mythic in the Greek chorus. I played one character named Helios. Uh, and uh, a, a challenge, I think the biggest challenge of, of Mythic was was just that the ensemble took up so much space in the show. And so we we almost never left the stage in this like roller coaster one act musical. And so we were always on stage sort of occupying, uh, occupying space in different ways and playing different characters. Uh, and doing this like insane choreography, singing these insane songs, and then you know leaving stage maybe briefly for a second just to come back for another one. So I think that was that was maybe the most difficult part. Um, but I think there is a lot of joy in that as well because I just got to share the stage with my ensemble, and especially being part of that Greek chorus, the unit of of seven was just um, mm -hmm. such a gift, and we really did become like a like one entity by by the time we started and finished the run. So I'm uh, I'm really, really grateful for that, for going through that challenge with them. Yeah, I should specify, of course, that there's there's five actors here and you're each representative of one of the five performance categories, lead, actress or actor, and supporting actor, actress. And what does it mean for you to be uh, nominated in the ensemble? Like, what does that represent for you? Oh man, it means the world to me and to the rest <laughs> of my ensemble. Like, cause we, we we were we just grew so close and we we uh, mm -hmm. developed this connection that was so strong and uh, we we shared so much love for each other and we would you know leave stage and be like does anyone else feel that <laughs> or like is anyone else noticing like we there's a lot of love going on here and there's something really magical happening on stage so to be recognized for that I think felt um, just landed really deeply with with our ensemble and uh, so I feel personally really, really grateful for that. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. What about you, Matt? Who was your character in Mob and what was the joy or challenge of that character? Uh, I played a played a guy named Martin um, and he's a very down on his luck sort of fellow. Um, he'd moved out to the Eastern Townships to live with his aunt because he'd sort of lost what little he had. And um, he was he was a guy who was in a lot of pain and he deals with that in different ways. And that's sort of the nature of the play. And um, I think for me, the, the biggest challenge was just doing the part because at, like literally at the end of every performance, I had a headache and a bad one because it was just, I had to put out so much energy um, and retain so much tension to play him that it was really just, it was who was difficult to do and difficult to maintain. Wow! So you felt physically just like stressed and in pain at the end of it. Yeah, yeah. Wow, it's intense. Well, you know, you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> got to do it, yeah. <laughs> but it's also, yeah. but it's also, you know, I, I suppose one of the joys of it was also doing it because yeah. the play, it's it's myself and Adrian Richards and Susan Bain. It's the three of us on stage for uh, for the whole show. 
Mm. Um, and, you know, we had this wonderful set um, uh, at the Centaur that we got to just live in for for as long as we did before we got shut down like how everything many, else. How many shows did you guys get in before the cancellation happened? We, we got 12 shows into a 30 show run. So wow. that's unfortunate, but yeah. such is life. Yeah, and what about you, Amir? Who was your character, Winter's daughter? And what was one of the joys or challenges of that character? Well, I didn't actually have a character, I had two. Um, I played, uh, yeah, I'll have you know. Um, so I played the, <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I played the peddler and uh, a character called Giacomo um, in uh, Winter's Daughter, produced by Tablet Oak Theater, uh, written by Jesse Stong. Um, I would say that the, uh, the biggest joy, um, I mean, I've often heard actors say that they enjoy playing relatable villains. And in the case of Giacomo, I really enjoyed playing him because he was a, he was a wounded douchebag. Uh, he was the kind of character that, you know, you first meet him and you're like, oh, this guy sucks, man. This guy's the worst. And then over the course of the play, I think, you know, you start to get to know, um, you, you start to get acquainted with the heart that he has and how his his wounds manifest themselves. And you see a, a human being behind all of that shit. And um, that was a joy. That was fun. That was It was fun to find the human being behind the veneer of this like douchey person. Um, and I would say another joy and also challenge was uh, really trying to ground myself in, in the reality of the circumstances of the world. Um, you know, it was, the play was set in Italy in um, just after the first world war. And uh, yeah, that was, it was a joy to kind of use images from that time to really try to like putting images into my sort of visual library and grounding myself through images in the world was really interesting for me as a process, as a way in. And uh, yeah, so that was joy and challenge, a bit of both. Mm, I don't know absolutely. if uh, that answers the question. Yeah. But. And you guys, have a few of you have mentioned this idea that, you know, characters can be kind of off-putting or to use your word, Amir, mm. douchey. Um, is it is it your job to fall in love with the character in some ways? Like, how do you approach a character that, let's say, you don't you don't like or that you feel better than or what like is, is your job to kind of find a way to endear yourself this character this character to you like do you see that as part of what your work is uh to kind of take that judgment and transform it into something else is that part of what it is to be an actor and i'll leave that for anybody well i think absolutely i mean um i i think it's kind of it's impossible to play a character if you're as you're performing, you're being judgmental about the character because that's not a that's not portraying a human being in sort of real time. It's just whatever happens to be on your mind. I don't, I don't even know how to qualify that, but um, but yeah, I think it's important to. I mean, uh, for me, I I, rem I remember watching Schindler's List years ago and seeing Ray Fine, Ray Fine's play the the SS officer, mm -hmm. who was an absolute monster. But what I got from his performance was how, how honest he was trying to portray this character. He wasn't saying, look at me, I'm a monster. He was, through his performance, explaining to us what was going on in this guy's mind. Monster or no, he's a human being and he's making decisions, he's doing things. And it was very clear what that was. So, I mean, with a character like Martin, you know, he's a, a guy that has troubles and, um, you know, it's it's very easy to play him when he's when he's happy-go-lucky, but when the pain and the anger starts coming out, you know, I, I, I have to meet that with love and understanding mm -hmm. so that I can show the audience what's going on in Martin's head. Mm, absolutely. Anybody else? Any insights to that? No, apparently not. <laughs> um, do you ever feel that there are certain kinds of like uh, character traits or kind of states or affects or types of characters that you feel that you're per like particularly adept at playing? And I'll give you an example. And actually, this will take us to a clip uh, that we have of a little web series that Julie and I actually did together called Mother's <laughs> Try. Uh, and I remember as we were filming this show, it's about mothers and, and how 
they fail all the time. And I remember saying to Julie that one of the states I feel she plays really well is exasperated. Like there's just something that she does <laughs> just, I don't know what it is, but you just communicate kind of like um, bafflement and exhaustion and kind of like, just, I can't, uh, you do that very well, right? So it's a bit of a kind of state or kind of energy um, that I think Julie has uh, really well. So just to get you think about as we watch this clip from Mother's Try, what might be a kind of state or character trait that you're kind of particularly <laughs> adept at? So let's watch this clip. I have an idea. Yeah. You know those things that you buy to put on your wine glass so you can tell whose wine glass yeah, is? Yeah, those are so stupid. Why? Oh, I just like hold on to my wine glass. I don't put it down long enough that it needs its own like but don't earring. But do you remember parties? What? Parties where there's like a lot of people and everybody's moving and talking and now you're here and then now you're over there and then I'm gonna have more chips and then I'm gonna go sneak outside for a smoke. A smoke? And you lose your wine glass sometimes because there's so many people. I just don't think it's such a problem. It's $10 for a box of those Stupid. Things. So my idea, you know those plastic stickers kids put on the window and then you peel it off yeah. again? Use that on your wine glass. Because uh, it's glass. Let me show you. Okay, so, like, you can be the crab. Mm. I can be the dinosaur. Mm. Somebody else can be the sailboat. Or you could, like, put a few on all of them. Well, no, because that now it's all just... Mm. So we should have a party. Yeah. Like a mummy's party, I guess. Yeah. I guess. She probably wouldn't want me to use these anyway. No, you should put them back. Yeah. Where they were. I know. My Lord, Julie, I adore you. <laughs> so fun. And the thing That's about, incredible. I talking to Julie, even about the fact, and correct me if I'm wrong, Julie, but I remember you saying something that like, you don't, you didn't really see yourself as doing comedy very much. And I just remember thinking like, what? Like, I just, you're so funny to me. Uh, and that exasperation, that kind of thing that I was describing before is such something that's so in your wheelhouse. Um, so yeah, I'm just wondering how you guys feel about just like, what are some kinds of energies or states or characters that you have a kind of particular adeptness at playing? Um, first, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, no, go ahead Julie, you should be able to re reply to that. <laughs> <laughs> first, I thought that when you said that I was really adept at playing this state that I was really adept at playing, I thought you were going to say drunk. Well, there <laughs> That one too, yes. <laughs> but you know, what's funny is that I actually do think that I uh, am, can play comedy, but I never get cast as in anything funny. Um, I'm always cast in like super dark stuff when someone is dying in my arms or you know, <laughs> I, you know I'm killing somebody or I'm searching for somebody. And it's just, it's like, you know, emotions and I don't know why somebody mm -hmm. cast me in like a musical or something please yes <laughs> <laughs> so somebody else what, what's a kind of trait or state you think you're kind of adept at playing I'm gonna go with um, I'm just like blind panic uh, somebody who lives life on the verge of breakdowns just const <laughs> like um, <laughs> essentially where there is really no acting required uh on my part just like uh, <laughs> so i can just be myself <laughs> completely naturally and um <laughs> use my <laughs> just use the facts of my life to be like here you go here have some of this this is what um so yeah essentially where the work is done for me by my own life experience okay and i can just sort of be like here i got a little bit of this and this and this and yeah and i'm okay. you know basically take the evening off <laughs> <laughs> um 
Well, I, I seem to have played a lot of kings in, mm. in my time, which is, you know, playing royalty is always a, a fun thing to do. Because, mm -hmm. um, just because you have to consider little things like, like you don't go to people, people come to you, for example. And so you get to hold yourself and act a certain a certain way. And that's that's always kind of fun. Um, and uh, I, t <laughs> I tend to really like uh, things that are explosive. Mm. Um, it's uh it might be a little cheap of me but uh but i i i, I really do enjoy it um because i think it's just <laughs> what earlier in my career um my mother is one of my biggest supporters and always has been and she came to see me in a play for elysian river theater with um paul van dyke who's nominated in the same category as me mm -hmm. um and uh, I got to play Lord Capulet, and I really just laid into people. And she would tell me that she was that I made her frightened of her own son at the end. Uh, like anytime she saw me do that kind of thing, and so I knew that if I could frighten my own mother, mm. that I would be doing it right. Um, and uh, yeah, so yeah, that's something I yeah. <laughs> What about you, Patrick? I feel like I feel like I, I can only base it off of what I've, I've auditioned for since I'm still pretty uh, early on in my career and still mm -hmm. like very emerging. But I feel like I always go out for like frail boy, <laughs> sometimes frail boy who <laughs> sings <laughs> like they're like, he looks meek as hell. Get him in here. And I'm like, yeah, here I come. Which was funny for Mythic because Mythic there was like, you know, that it wasn't the show for that kind of character at all. It's like explosive the whole way through. And it's funny because the character I ended up playing like in the ensemble we had um i think we had up to three or four characters that you audition for because there's all these like little gods and demons who pop up in mythic um and the one i ended up getting is this super like bro -y, like bah, 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 kind of guy and i i knew when i did it that the way i was engaging with like the the casting people and stuff that that it was landing and i was like oh the, there he is there's mr helios sitting up there with mm -hmm. his sunglasses and his drink um yeah, so I think I think it's kind of funny. I think similar to Julie, like I I really enjoy doing comedy, and I think like even in school, like I did a lot of comedy, enjoyed doing it. But I tend to uh, they tend to want me to be a little shy and scared. <laughs> Tends to be what I go for. What about you, Alex? Um, I would say like functionally effed up uh, is like something I get <laughs> or um, like I don't know high drama or uh, the journalist who will stop at nothing to get that story. <laughs> those, those are kind of my things. <laughs> I'd love to do more comedy too. Well, in a couple of you brought up this idea, you know, Julie mentioned on, and Patrick hit on it as well. Is there a lot of frustration um, in acting in terms of like parts that you want to play and the parts that you, you find that like people see you as being suited to? Like is that a, is that a source of frustration in terms of like what you see yourself as, but what people in casting seem to see you fitting? I think it can be. I think it definitely can be. I mean, for me, like I attribute it a lot to to race. I'm always like, oh, people don't think Asians are funny <laughs> uh, because there's so little representation, which is which is sad to me. But but uh, but I find I wish I wish there was more space for you know like for people of color to play. Uh, roles outside of what you know, like what people like, I don't know, beyond like stereotypes and beyond what people like perceive um, we're good at or something. So that that's something I I often associate with like not being um, not being or not getting a not being able to explore certain things I want to explore is as I kind of associate it with uh, stereotypes that are associated with my race, which is frustrating. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's that's just one thought <laughs> that came into my head. Anybody else struggle with that? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do struggle with that. I mean, and beyond all of the the issues to do with representation and of marginalized performers, I, I also think that um, opening up casting uh, is actually something which makes for better theater. Uh, because I think what's interesting about theater for me is the idea that you're uh, asking, you're inviting the audience to participate in um, the creation of the thing themselves, right? So if, you know, everybody should be able to play, you know, it's not, um, 
you know, your, your mother could be performed by a chair. You know, that's what's fun about theater is when when it's so absurd that you're, you're inviting the audience to basically say, come along and help us create this thing. It's the muse of fire. You know what I mean? So I don't think the idea of casting should even exist. I don't think that there should be types of people that could only, you know, I, I think it should be blown right open because that's what's fun about all of this um, is when you show up and you watch a show and your brother is a pencil you know, or whatever, like, <laughs> maybe I'm kidding. All right, I'll spare you my doctoral thesis. But I mean, I just, that's... Um... Anybody else want to weigh in on this one? You don't have to. Caitlin, I didn't actually hear the question. Uh, the question, the question was my Wi-Fi cut out, so I didn't. The question was if it's frustrating the kind of discrepancy between the roles you see yourself being able to play and the roles that it would seem that you know casting people in casting or directors seem to see you in, like the discrepancy between how you see yourself as an actor and how people who cast see you as an actor, is that frustrating? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that um, uh, it's interesting because as I've gotten older, <laughs> as I've gotten older, I've gotten the opportunity to play the things that I wanted to play when I was younger. So when I was younger, it was very frustrating um, because it was always sort of like the, 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 I don't know. I mean, it was, it was, yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. But it just it it has gotten better right. as I've gotten older. Some things do. Enough. Some things do. I guess. Nice. Um, a bit earlier, Amir was talking about the fact that uh, you play Panic very well, um, and I'm just curious. You know, like what what you guys do is a lot of people's like worst nightmare, right? I mean, like a lot of a lot of people. Most people think you're nuts, right? Um, do you experience stage fright, and what do you do about it? Because you know it's funny, like even even like doing these conversations each evening, I've been super conscious of the fact that like the whole day, I'm like, there's that thing that's live tonight. Like my whole day is informed by the fact that this thing is coming in the evening, right? It's impossible not to think about it. And I've always thought with actors, I'm like, how do you spend your whole day knowing you got to do this thing at the end that's like big and epic and and dramatic and like you're building up to it all day. So what's it like to kind of deal with stage fright if you have it, and how do you manage it? Well, uh, on the, the last thing that you said, one of the things that I've always found really amazing about theater is the inevitability of it. Because um, theater is this, this weird thing where you work really hard for however long you work, and then you put this thing out in the world, and then it's gone. Oof, like that, that show is gone. And so that's something that's interesting to me. But the, it's also like, you know, okay, 7.30, the lights are coming on and you're going uh, no matter what that's that is what's happening today and it's just this inexorable inescapable thing and i find something zen about that mm. um personally um and as far as stage fright i'm i'm terrified all the time um and uh, for for my entire career the the way that i've considered it is the day that I'm not scared to step on a stage is the day I should get out of the game. Because mm. you just been you become so blasé about it that it just wouldn't be. Yeah, I, I've seen actors who who become they start to get a, a sense of entitlement and you know oh this is just what I do and you know, I'm supposed to do this I expect to do this and there's something amazing about the position that we find ourselves in. It's mm. It's, it's really quite incredible, you know? I mean, we live in the second largest city in one of the wealthiest nations of all time. And we get to do these main stage productions. And that puts us in this category, this is really small category of people who get to do something like that. And so to um, not recognize how amazing that is and how fortunate we are is just beyond me hmm what about you amir do you experience stage fright and if so how do you what do you do um i absolutely experience stage fright i mean i mean not to get too i mean I, yeah i uh i think that i i enjoy experiencing stage fright actually because if i don't experience the stage fright i don't then feel the reward of having overcome that yeah. fear 
And it's the very fear that allows me to feel good about having, you know, overcome it. And so if I, I can't ever feel brave if I don't feel the fear. And I, so needing, yeah. I need the stage fright um, and I enjoy it weirdly, uh, or I enjoy confronting it and then feeling good about having confronted it. I mean, I, for the longest time, I, I couldn't even leave my room. I mean, I, beyond stage fright, I, I, you know, I've been through a lot in my life and, uh, you know, I've survived some horrible things and, uh, you know, so in some ways becoming an actor was my way of trying to deal with all of it. Um, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, absolutely. I experienced stage fright and, and thank God for that. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Alex, what about you? Um, yeah, I definitely get stage fright, but something that I've noticed about myself is that uh, I, I generally feel more afraid once the performance is over. <laughs> How does that work? It's, it's sort of like I get really petrified about like going into the lobby and like leaving the space behind. Um, and I think it's like, must, it must be a combination of like adrenaline and um, exhaustion. But uh, yeah, I, I find that like my stage fright manifests in like quite a, a somatic way. Um, and it often comes on either halfway through the show or right at the very end where I'm like, I'm done. Now I can be nervous about the mm. thing that I just did. Um, mm. Yeah, it's, just, it's complicated. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else stage fright and how you cope with it? I get, yeah, I get state. I mean, I don't know if I have anything that hasn't been said, but I, I'm, I'm sitting here listening to all this and it resonates with me really strongly. And I'm also thinking I have stage fright right now. <laughs> like I have stage fright <laughs> for this. <laughs> like, it's, still, it's still in. I'm hoping Every you're laughing because you also have that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah well, I, I, mean, I think about like, oh, sorry, Caitlin, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say it goes back to that definition of courage where people say that, you know, courage isn't not having fear. It's like having the fear and still doing the thing. But, you know, I, I think exactly. people might assume that actors are just like, oh, they must just be like, they just, you know, can do this without getting nervous. And they just, it, they, it doesn't affect them. And it's like, no, of course it affects them. Like, of course you, it you does. You can't be dead to not be affected by it. But it's just, there's something uh, about how you manage it. And I love the way you put it, Amir, that it's just like, if I don't go through this, I don't get the thing that I want to feel, which is that like I survived, I got through it. Mm -hmm. And that's how you get to experience that, that feeling of having had courage, right? But without going through that sense of the fear. Um, and I appreciate you saying that, Patrick, because like I've been getting nervous every night that I'm doing these things, right? That it, there's, there's a certain amount of anxiety around it, but also that the end of it, that satisfaction of like, I moved through that. I didn't get to avoid it. I had to move through it though, right? Which is a yeah. very different. And I think it just also kind of signifies that it's it's important to you in some way and that you have an impulse that lies there. Like I remember I, I TA'd for a class at Concordia once and and it was a first year class and we were, it was a presentation day. And and it was just one of those things where the teacher was like, well, whoever wants to go can go and you know, no one moves. And then the teacher offered, she said, um, it was Laura Quigley, by the way, we love Laura Quigley. And she said, she said, uh, if you feel nervous right now when I'm saying you can go whenever you want. That's that's your indication that you want to go. That's your that's your fire, and that really stuck with me because you know every night when I'm like about to do the thing tonight, even when I'm about to do the thing, I'm like, well, that's my fire. Here we go. <laughs> so yeah, it, it really just is that is that push to to go forward and and yeah. And I I don't know. I don't have anything else to I guess add well, to that. Well, they often say that you can like reinterpret the nerves as excitement, right? That if you feel if you're feeling that kind of nervous energy, that if, reframe it as like well you're excited then it's also the same kind of physiological symptoms you have when you're excited right so reframe it that way it can often help push through as well mm -hmm. julie anything to add to it stage fright or are you, are you frozen no might be frozen okay oh, uh, well, oh. yeah am i frozen no it, you're yeah. not right now <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Matt? Okay, okay. I, I'll I, talk I just, really fast. Um, I get stage fright all the time. <laughs> 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 and over to, over to you, Matt, what were you gonna say? Well, I just wanted to tack on to all of this. Uh, 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 Amir, I thought what you said was, was absolutely beautiful. Um, and I think that part of, the, part of the nerves that I feel, and I'm assuming other people feel, um, before going on stage is, not always just about me, 
and you know, oh, am I going to do a good job, or am I going to forget a line, or am I going to screw up? But um, I I feel a responsibility to the audience who's come to see me, you know, because I mean, we all we all know instantly a dishonest performance. Like it's it's so easy to spot, but to see an honest performance, like a truly honest performance, it moves you, and so my goal every night is to go out there and give the audience the show that will move them. And it's, uh, it's not easy. It's, it's really hard. And so a lot of the fear that I feel going on is just me trying to make sure that I'm up to that task. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. It's not just about ourselves for sure. I just want to get into some of the, the challenges that you guys might encounter and see how you play these things out. What do you do if you're working on a script you don't actually like? And I'm sure you've all had this experience. You don't have to name any names or name any plays. But how do you approach a project when like your first instinct when you read the script is like, huh? <laughs> what do you do? What do you do? Where do you go next if that's your first reaction? Like you're off, you got the gig, you're doing this project, you read the script, and you're like, yeah, not so much. Um, what do you do next? I think personally, um, you you write all of the things that aren't written yourself. Um, you you fill in the story more on your own. You know, you um, again, you fill up your visual library. You you. You, you nourish your imagination, which is the thing that you, I, well, I try to use on the stage. So I put images in my head that will allow me to ground myself in the reality of this person's life. Um, things which don't rely on the text. I try to get give myself um, hooks and ways in um, that don't rely on the words on the page. Um, it just means that I think you have to do a bit more work on your own. Um, to try to, to try to round it out for yourself because you can't necessarily use the text as, as the way in. The text is a kind of byproduct of all of the other stuff that you've figured out already about this person's life. Um, I think that's that's what has to happen personally. Yeah. What else? What do you do? Where do you go next? I feel like a thought that I'm having when when I've read a script and and had like you know questions about it or just read it went. Like, I'm not sure about this. Um, something, so I, I found it maybe, I don't know if the word is helpful, but uh, freeing, I guess, to like, just sort of um, wait for, for those moments that you weren't sure about to come come alive in rehearsal and be open to how those moments can surprise you. Because I think, I mean, the beautiful thing about, you know, theater in, in, in general is that, you know, the words really do get lifted off the page and there could be a moment that that you really weren't sure about uh, that you read on paper that when you see it on its feet you're like oh that's that's what it was or 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 i understand it differently now and even when even if that moment doesn't happen i find that um for myself if if there are if there are you know whether it be a, a parts of the show that i'm not a huge fan of or or just moments that are really hard like i i like to think of just um i don't know almost like bookmarking moments in the show that i really do love and and getting to those through, through the throughout the show and just like letting myself fall in love with the moments that I um, that I am really close to um, instead of focusing on the ones that I'm not um, super fond of. Um, right. Yeah, it's strategy. Anybody else? Strategy. Um, well, I think I've been pretty fortunate in my career that you know I've never I've never gotten a script for something I'm going to do and just been like. Ooh, uh, like <laughs> I, I've I've enjoyed everything that I've done, and I think it kind of it goes back a little bit. Um, <laughs> my thoughts are everywhere on this one. Um, there was this amazing film about Beethoven, and they were talking about the power of his uh, um, of his symphonies. And one character said the most amazing thing about it is that it gives you a window into the soul of the creator, and uh, and I think that's what a play does with a playwright is it sort of gives you a window into their soul and that sort of thing but for me it comes back to things that i've already said today which are honesty and love for the character you know no matter no matter the reason that you might feel that a play is good or bad or 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 questionable or or whatever at the end of the day for me it's just about um 
just figuring out who this person is and portraying them in as honest a way as possible. And mm. that's that's all like all I really have control over. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else? Any insights into this? What you do with a script you don't like? I think you just have to take it on as a challenge and um, try your best to make it better and fix as many problems as you can um, in other ways. It's I think it's our job as actors to serve the story. Um, and if it means that you can't serve the text, you can still serve the story. Um, mm. What do you mean by that? Can you explain that? I don't know. I think um, there is plenty of stories that that don't exist within the words, as as some other people have said. And you know, the the visual language of imagery, um, of emotion, of um, there's stories everywhere. And I think that. There's so much more than than the words chosen. Um, so, yeah, that's that's what I would say. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, absolutely. It's an interesting take on it. And what do you do? Um, what do you do when you don't agree with a director? When a director has an interpretation of a line, or uh, a whole character, or a moment, or a story point that does not gel with what you're thinking is happening, how do you how do you negotiate that, or how do you make a compromise when you're the one who has to be out there every night delivering this story and the director's fucked off to their next play. Um, <laughs> how do you, how do you deal with that? Well, I mean, it's just come. I have, I think you know? that, oh. No, it's just, I was just, like, it's, <laughs> it's kind of fantastical, I think, to imagine going into uh, a, 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 any production and everything is going to be smooth sailing, like from from day one to the end of the run. Everything's going to everybody's going to agree with each other. Everything's going to be fine, you know. And there's not going to be any conflict. And when the job of the play is to portray conflict, so you know, it happens all the time that you know I, I get into conflict with directors, and and sometimes it's a small thing. You work it out really easy, and sometimes you know both sides get really entrenched, um, and it's it it can be difficult. Um, Have you ever had to and, play a moment uh, though, like night after night, that you're like, I disagree with this choice? Yeah. Yes, How absolutely. Do you do that? I would find that really hard, knowing that like every night I'm saying this line that I'm like, this line is supposed to be ironic, and I'm saying it earnestly, and I don't want to. Um, isn't that where some of the rebellion comes in, where directors come back and see a show three weeks later, and they're like, eh. um, mm -hmm. does that ever happen? Because I would find that super difficult to to do that. No, is it just me? I, I think that, um, I, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. <laughs> yes, okay, good. My God, I'm sitting in my hallway now, like I'm sitting on the floor in my hallway because my Wi-Fi is so <laughs> shitty. Um, You're a hero. I think that, uh, <laughs> I think that um, it's actually, I mean, barring any kind of like safety concerns, um, I think that an actor needs to really, uh, needs to the thing is the director is the person who sees the universe of the play and mm -hmm. the actor does not necessarily that's not our job as actors our job is to fulfill that the um our job is uh not to see the universe of the play and so i often feel like even though it's something that we might not want to do as actors that the director um actually does see like because I have seen stuff where the actors have sort of taken it from the director mm -hmm. you know a couple of weeks in and I'm like oh man I think that some something went off the rails there um <laughs> I think we saw that show so, too <laughs> <laughs> but I really I really do feel like that it's we have to sort of like balance our ego with mm -hmm. um our our work ethic um mm -hmm. and i mean if everybody starts going mm -hmm. i don't think the director's right then i mean it's just going to fall apart anyway mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And i think that's really well put and just to amend the sort of conflict thing that i was saying before is that you know conflict can be positive 
you know i mean i don't think you want to agree with everybody all the time you know um anyway it's it's just it's just it's it's part of the challenge of putting the play together you know yes. people care you know yes. and i think i think what julie said about balancing your ego and your worth that work ethic is uh, you know, if you get into an argument with a director because of your ego, then that serves absolutely nothing. Mm. But if you, if you see something a certain way and you're trying to communicate that, and the director sees it another way and they're trying to communicate that and there's some sort of failure to communicate, I mean, that happens and you work through it. And that's the job. Anybody else? Any insights into or advice well, about how to deal with director conflict? I mean, I, I think that... Um, I think it's important actually to just like voice your concern, but then, you know, if it doesn't get anywhere, you, you agree. But also when you actually start the run, if you're not in dialogue with the audience on a nightly basis and listening to their reaction and allowing the show to adapt in ways that you're not even aware of, then I don't think you're really doing your job either. And, you know, I, I can, I can conceive of situations where, you know, um, you it turns out that what you thought was actually right and the director was wrong and what you're getting back from the audience confirms that your suspicion was correct and i think that you know given that i mean within reason i think you you should allow it to shift because of what you're getting back from the audience because at the end of the day we're all just sort of like blindly you know kind of sketching out what we think might work but you know i think that the point of this is that it's in constant change and in constant evolution and if we if we allow ourselves to get rigid and assume that we know the answer i don't think we're actually respecting this medium um the the what's powerful about this medium is precisely the fact that it isn't set in stone and that it changes every night so um so i think we have to allow for that possibility by not necessarily being like okay this is the show and this is how you say your line and that's it i don't know yeah, but you bring up the run, which is really interesting, because of course, like, is, is usually being on the kind of directing side of things. I'm always kind of, I always marvel that once I get to walk away, that the actors are going to just keep doing this fucking show every night. And and in my mind, I'm like, oh my god, I can't imagine having to do this show every night. And I'm always fascinated with it by this idea of how much repetition there is in what you guys do. And I'm always curious about how that lives inside of you, that kind of how different one show feels from the next, or what it's like to be kind of you know, in a longer run of a show, how that kind of um, revisiting of things, how different it feels each time, and also just how the kind of constant return to the same thing lives inside of you, because I don't experience that, it's not my um, my part in, in, in the production. So I'm curious if you have anything to say about kind of that, that muscle of repetition, or any insights into kind of, is it even repetition, and does it feel different enough that it doesn't feel that way? I, I think that uh, the 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 goal, at least for me, is for it to not become repetition. Because as soon as it becomes repetition, then um, I'm kind of you know ripping off the audience, and I'm ripping off myself and the rest of the company, because we want to really be living in that moment. And so, yes, repetition as far as if I'm <laughs> if going if I'm going to like you know. Uh, push or hit or whatever like of course I want to stay with the same blocking but as far as what's happening internally um, I'm living in that moment and so it should never be repetition and so um, as Amira was saying it's a constant it's a living thing it's constantly mm -hmm. growing so it's never going to stay in the same place as opening night um, yeah mm -hmm. anybody else repetition how it lives inside of you I'm thinking specifically, I think, I think musical theater is an interesting place to, to like think about repetition just because there are so many parts that need to stay the same every night in terms of like your music shouldn't, you know, it's not the, it's not exactly the place to like start freestyling <laughs> harmonies, like whenever you have the impulse to and, or, or changing choreography that would, that would, you know, derail the show in like a whole bunch of ways. So, um, and, and there are all these really, really specific nitty gritty things, I think, especially as an ensemble member, if I'm reflecting specifically on Mythic, like um, that you need to like, that need to be that precise either for safety or for um, for just the story, telling the story or getting, you know, just getting to the end of the number. There are so many things that need to be specific. And 
I, I don't know. I don't think I'm contributing any new information here. But yeah, the beautiful thing is that there's just so many moving pieces that will feed the the energy and the the type of performance that you're going to give. Um, you know, whether it be like the difference of uh, how the audience reacts, or even just the difference of the day you had, or if you just like happen to make eye contact in this number with a different member of your team mm. that you didn't the night before, you know, like there are, there are so many of these little things that will sort of just like light a different fire in you, despite, you know, you're doing the same five, six, seven, eight, like <laughs> every night, I think um, there's still, there's, there's always going to be room to discover something new. And I think, again, um, I'm, I'm not sure who said it just before, but that's part of the, the beauty of, of the medium, I think, is that it, you know, it's, it's live, it's right in front of you. And, and, everything that happens is just so many spices like this person said. And there's yes, so, so, and so much spices. precision and so many moving parts in a musical. And I know that we have a clip from uh, rehearsals from Mythic. It'd be great to just watch that, just get a sense of how much is going on at the same time. Let's watch that clip. Oh, <laughs> when you are you when you watch that, Patrick? Do you feel those moods in your body again? Are they still kind of in you, the body memory? One hundred percent. And I even feel like a weird like this because I know I'm like, oh, that's the first version we did, and that changed in you know little ways. So it's it's not like I feel oh, like okay. a tension when I watch it too, which is funny. But I think that number is kind of a perfect example of what what I was just speaking to is, you know, because that number, the entire thing beyond being like, yay, fun opening number, crazy big stuff is also like the entire exposition for the whole show and it explains to you who every God is and what their relationship to each other is. And, mm -hmm. and you have to do that while trying not to kill the six of the people on stage with you and like, you know, <laughs> holding a person up eight feet in the air. And I'm like, this is what a Titan is, <laughs> you know? And, and so there's so many moving parts, but once, once that's kind of in your body and lands and is firm, that's where the the playfulness can begin and it all kind of happens outside of that and 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 inside too in some ways i think but but yeah it's, but it speaks it's really to that tension right between like this idea of repetition that there are certain things obviously like julie was saying too for safety or like in choreography like you have <laughs> to repeat it like it has to be done yeah. uh but within that the kind of the need to keep it fresh and keep it alive and keep it responsive uh and authentic right so that kind of balancing between the repetition but also the, the life staying vibrant within it absolutely what would you guys say? I've been asking uh, directors, I asked designers this as well. What is your sweet spot moment in, in kind of working on a production in terms of like, you know, your favorite time, uh, you know, from first read through to closing night? What's a moment that stands out for you in that timeline that you feel like is either where you shine the most or where you feel the most rewarded um, in your process? What stands out in that timeline? I mean, cue to cue probably up there for everybody, I know. <laughs> My personal favorite. What fun. Um, <laughs> others. That's a given. So others. I got to go with opening night. Yeah. That's, you know, oh, oh, there's something, there's something incredibly magical about opening night because no matter what happened in the rehearsal process, you're done. It's, mm -hmm. it's done. It's together. And now you get to show it to an audience who uh, audiences who come to opening night are different than audiences that come to the ninth performance uh, kind of thing. There's an energy in the audience and there's, a, there's the, the, the actors are buzzing because there's this whole idea of like, I wonder if we did it well, you know? I wonder if, I wonder if this is worth something to anybody kind of thing. And the, the collision of the two energies uh, is, is really, it's amazing. And, um, and you know, for, for, a, in terms of me doing the project, I mean that's that's the time that I get to find find out 
if it mm. worked. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the fun part, you know, the fun yeah. part begins. Mm -hmm. so else? Gonna say, they don't call it a rote, they call it a play. You know? mm. Mm. For me personally, it's, um, it's when you first get up on your feet, you know, mm -hmm. um, and you maybe you still have the script in your hand, but you're just sort of really trying to connect to, um, oh God, I feel like walking down this way right now or whatever. And you're just sort of freestyling your, your blocking or just trying things out and trying to uh, dig into the relationships, you know, and um, I sound like such an actor. I'm just like listening to myself talking. It's ridiculous. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean that in a bad way at all. I just, uh, so let me answer your question. Um, yeah, I, I think it's definitely like when you get up on your feet and just like start start putting it in your body. Yeah. Yeah. Julie, what's your favorite moment? I would say the first and third week of rehearsal. Okay, um, so specific. The first, first week, I really, I. <laughs> I really love. Oh no, she's cutting out. Love uh, table work. Um, I love sort of getting into the script and getting into uh, the character and and really solving problem. And then in the third week, because the second week is always shit. Because then, because you kind of go like, <laughs> "What am I doing? Oh my god! Like, why? I'm such a bad actor. I can't make my mind." It's like that moment when you're trying to get off book. That's like the worst time. And then when you finally have your lines and it's sort of like, it's, it's very, it is a very sweet spot because it's right before the time when you start panicking mm -hmm. before opening night, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a couple of days in there um, in the third week where you actually are getting deeper into the character and you start seeing runs of the play mm -hmm. and you understand mm -hmm the path that this whole story is on and what role you play within that. Mm -hmm. um, and Matt, I do not like opening mm -hmm. night, so I'm, I'm glad that you do. <laughs> <laughs> but it's such a, I mean, it's such a journey, right? Like what you guys are pointing out, there's so many yeah. different kinds of moments within the, the kind of the rehearsal process and obviously backing it up earlier for the production team, but there's such a, like a, a lengthy journey with so many different kinds of experiences within it. What about you, Patrick or Alex? What's uh? sweet spot moment for me the the moment i can think of is is the sits probe where mm. the band comes in and you get to hear all of the music like how it's going to sound for your run for the first time with like all the instruments that are included um i think it's like the most magical time of putting together a musical and it's like it comes at that perfect moment too where like at least at least in, in my experience, like I've been in a lot of like really dance heavy musicals. So doing that to just a piano is like is a really different experience, you know, in rehearsals, doing these sort of like pop like musical theater things to to just a piano is a really different experience to when you finally hear the drums and you finally hear the bass. Like it 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 breathes a new life into it, like right right in that last sort of quarter of rehearsals, which is like a really, I think, special time to uh, to introduce like a new moving piece, music in the bones, exactly. So I think it, I think it's like <laughs> I'm really responding to these. Um, uh, yeah, I think I just think it's a really really exciting thing. It feels like like the day before Sits Probe is like Christmas Eve. Like I think mm, it's the, the the best part. And you, Alex, what's your favorite moment? I feel like I have two. I, I, I really um, love being a part or, or being invited to design presentations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it gives me so much information and it's so unbelievably helpful yeah. um, to hear sounds, to see costumes, and, you know, all of that. But then I also really love the first stumble through and maybe that's an unpopular mm -hmm. opinion, but <laughs> it, it's, um, it's kind of like you just say F it and you sort of, you know, run as fast as you can into a wall and it really exposes the work that still needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think I think that's, uh, it's sort of like a nice combination of like, oh, it's time to pull up your socks and okay, we're not ready yet. Let's just have a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think those uh, moments of joy, sweet spot moments are a lovely note to wrap up this conversation on. I wanna thank you guys so much uh, for joining me for this discussion or performance. It's been awesome. To talk about our craft together. Thank you so much. 
Uh, the awards are this Sunday, uh, November 29th at seven o'clock, virtual ceremony, there it is, November 29th. And of course, we've only been talking to a slice of all the nominees, so you're gonna see the full list of nominees for the Metas, it's at metas.ca. Uh, I wanna thank the Metas, uh, the Matak specifically, and even more specifically, Stephen McLean Rogers, for all the assistance they gave in putting this together. This is an idea that I pitched pretty last minute, to be honest, and they really rallied to help make it happen, as well as the Siegel Center for Performing Arts and Lisa Rubin, who got on board real fast and wanted to uh, bring this together. So I'm super grateful to everybody. Also, the backstage team that we've had working uh, in rotation on this show, which have included Angela, Debbie, Mel, Gabriella, Sarah, um, I've all been contributing backstage, dropping in all these photos and doing the social media and stuff. I'm not, I'm not doing that. I cannot multitask like that at all. And thank you for rolling with all the technical glitches. This is it. It's 2020, right? This is, this is the way it's been happening. Um, but thank you so much for your contributions, guys. It's been great to see you and I wish you all the best. Take care and good night. <laughs>